Amen. Not to be uh, complicated, but uh, um, the current platform we're using for our church management and everything is, um, for lack of a better word, been a little wonky. If I can use the word wonky, I don't know. It's not really a word, but I made it one, so there you go. Um, but this new one will be much easier. Everything will be done through the app, and there won't be as much of a necessity for some of our team leads and others to have to actually get on their computer. Everything can pretty well be done through an app. So I um, want to uh, encourage you, if you have questions about that, out at our Connect Center in the lobby, um, grab that piece of paper. Pastor Nathan will be out there at the end of service. And there's a QR code where you can go straight to download our new app and, and, and whatever's going to be there, which functions much easier. Um, so I want to encourage you in that. Um, I know it sounds like a lot. And if you need help with it, let us know. Uh, I do want to encourage you to feel free to ask. Um, well, let me say good morning. That was better. You guys have been quiet this morning. I know it's rainy. It was a good sleeping morning, but uh, thank you for coming. And again, want to say welcome. It's awesome to have you with us. Um, I do want us to, uh, for a moment, um, I, th- I think I saw Carol and Alan around here somewhere. Oh, okay. Um, they had their 62nd anniversary just uh, um, this weekend, and so I uh, was going to congratulate them. But be in prayer for John, um, just having a lot of health issues and um, remember John in your prayers, and also uh, Darla's with us uh, this morning, and uh, I want to pray for Darla, her family. If you are not aware, Friday afternoon, um, Dave, her husband, just passed away suddenly, um, unexpectedly, um, and so we want to pray for the, her and her family, and um, God is uh, um, in control. One thing we know, and, and, and not to um, trivialize it, because there's nothing um, small about that. Um, but the Bible says that as believers, as we grieve, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Amen. We know Dave is with the Lord. And uh, while we can celebrate that, we also know family, loved ones grieve. And so please lift Darla, and she's here with us this morning, and her family to the Lord. I want to pray for them. And um, he was here with us at church Wednesday night and Friday, just... Uh, it was his time to go and be with the Lord. So be in prayer for them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Can we just pause for a moment and just ask a word of prayer for these needs? And um, stand with me, if you would. I know we're getting our calisthenics in this morning, but um, can we just pray for them and just ask for God's uh, provision, his comfort, his peace? Amen? And uh, our God is a God of peace. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness. And Lord, we today know that Dave is with you, Lord, that he, he knows you, and Lord, he was prepared to meet you, Lord, and today he's in your presence. And Lord, we can take a moment and just say thank you for your faithfulness, for your salvation, Lord, that God, you paved a way and prepared a way for Dave. But Lord, we also today, Lord, ask that you, by your presence, by your Holy Spirit, that you would be with Darla, with the family, God, that they would just sense you near every step and every moment. That God, that uh, uh, where your presence is, God, we know there's a peace. We know there's a comfort. And God, I just pray today that your peace and comfort would just reign and rule in their hearts, in their homes. God, that you would be with them in everything as they uh, make plans and and all the things that have to be tended to. That, Lord, there would just be a, a peace, Lord, that overwhelms them. And God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Be with John, Alan, and Carolyn, Lord, that God, you just touched John and his health. And we just take this moment, Lord, to thank you that you are a good God, that you paid the price, Lord, that we might know you and that we might even experience your healing and your blessings upon us, Lord. We thank you for it and we give you all the praise today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. You can be seated if you would. Um, one of uh, this week, is, as you feel the Holy Spirit may be leading you, reach out to Darla and and uh, the family and see if there's anything we can do. Don't want to overwhelm them with too much, but at the same time, uh, express your concern, your love, your condolences. We're going to be uh, in a variety of places throughout Scripture this morning. If you want to turn to Acts chapter 13, that's where we're going to begin. But I want to begin, and I have, have been sharing with you that I was going to begin this series probably for a couple of weeks now, but I'm going to start a series on prayer and fasting. And this morning, I want to start with a very simple question as to why prayer and fasting. 
I think if we're going to talk about it, we have to know why it's something that God wants us to do. Amen? It's great to talk about principles, and it's great to talk about things that God asked us to do, but I also think a why is important to know. Would you agree? So how many know, and I believe this, it's easier to stay in bad habits than to build good habits? Anybody agree? Anybody living that? Right? It is just the way that we are wired. It's easier to grab some Oreos than to peel an orange. I don't know why, but isn't it? It is easier to veg out on the couch than to exercise. I am guilty. I sat on the couch this weekend and watched my wife work out. <laughs> Honest truth. So I'm preaching to myself here a little bit. It's easier to scroll on your phone than read a book that's going to help you. And most of what you scroll through on the phone is not encouraging. It's true. Come on. It's easier to pop open a can of soda than to fix a cup of green tea. Right? This is why if you really plan to replace a bad habit with a good habit, you have to have a really strong why. Right? If I'm going to deny something I want in order to attain a goal, I have to have a vision of why I'm doing it. You've got to keep front and center the healthy body or brain that you want to have if you're going to say no to the Oreo and grab some fruit. Right? And that's why many times people don't get serious about their health until something happens. And they're, because why? They suddenly have a vision of what they're trying to accomplish or what they're trying to avoid. So when we begin to change habits, you have to have a strong why. And it's the same with spiritual habits. This sermon series is going to focus on two habits that do not come naturally. Can I just tell you that? Prayer does not come naturally. Right? Fasting does not come naturally. It is a lot easier not to do it. Some of you may be more spiritual than me. You're looking at me like, well, it's easier not to pray. True? It's easier not to fast. So if we're going to do those things, we've got to have in front of us a strong vision of what those disciplines are going to lead to. And the two spiritual habits we're going to be talking about during this series, I think it's obvious, is prayer and fasting. Prayer is talking to God, and we're going to be talking about developing regular rhythms of prayer. Fasting is taking some time to go without something. Usually or often it's, it's in reference to food in order to devote that time to connecting with God. Some of you, the first time you fast, it may not be food. The thing that may be your biggest obstacle may be what we talked about earlier, your phone. Right? I mean, that's a you and God conversation, not a Pastor Steve and you conversation. Now, here's the thing, though. If life is basically going okay, and you've got a busy schedule... Why would you take the time to build these two spiritual habits into your schedule? Why would you do it? Just like with other habits, healthy eating and exercise, you only develop those if you have a strong why. You have to have in mind a vision of what prayer and fasting will lead to. So I want to spend a little time today talking about what does prayer and fasting lead to? Isn't that our why? I want to begin by looking at the first missionary journey. After Jesus had ascended into heaven, they go to the upper room and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. We know 3,000 people are saved. and The disciples, the apostles, they began this process 
of figuring out what next steps were. And so Paul and Barnabas are actually the ones that went on the first missionary journey. They went out from Antioch in Syria, and they planted churches all throughout Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And before heading back to the city of Antioch in Syria, Paul and Barnabas circled back and appointed elders at the churches they had planted. Then they returned home. Look with me to Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menane, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. As the church fasts and prays, the Holy Spirit sets apart Paul and Barnabas to do what? To become missionaries, right? To go out and to spread the gospel. Now, I'm not going to read for you all of Acts 13 and most of Acts 14, but I want to reference this. In Acts 13, verses 4 through 12, they share the gospel with the governor in Paphos, which is Cyprus, and he believes in Jesus. His attendant was a sorcerer who tries to stop him from hearing the gospel. And it tells us in that passage that after Paul prayed, he was struck blind so that he could not hinder the gospel. If you continue on in verses 13 through 49 of Acts 13, they then sail to the mainland of Asia Minor or modern day Turkey and they preach the gospel in synagogues in Antioch. And although people are receptive and many believe, the Jewish leaders, as we know, were hostile and abusive, and it prompted Paul to turn his ministry to who? The Gentiles, the non-Jews, right? And so Paul begins to share the gospel with them, and the gospel begins to spread throughout the whole region. Acts 14, 1 through 7 They then begin to preach in Iconium and they perform miracles and a great number of Jews and Gentiles believe in Jesus and persecution forces him to move on. The next place he goes is Lystra. Well, that's where they heal a person who can't walk and the locals believe that the gods have visited him and Paul and Barnabas are like, no, 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 we're not gods. We are just here on behalf of the God. Amen? Amen. And people begin to turn and accept Jesus and Jews from Antioch arrive. They turn the crowd against Paul and Barnabas and they stone Paul and they think he's dead. But guess what? He's not dead. I'm not sure what that looked like, but at some point after everybody walking away thinking he's dead, he gets up, I'm sure bloodied and absolutely mangled and makes his way to the next town to preach the gospel in a town called Derby, where many believe in Jesus. And then here's what's crazy. After he finishes in Derby, you know where he goes? Lystra, where he got stoned the first time. I don't know about you. I'm not going back there, right? It's like, I don't need round two, right? But they knew where God had called them to go. So after they finish in Derby, Where people accepted Jesus, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch and encouraged the new Christians there and they began to appoint elders for the churches that they started. Acts 14, 23 says this, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So let me ask you this question. What does prayer and fasting lead to? Number one, it leads to the spread of the gospel. The spread of the gospel. See, prayer and fasting open the church to the Holy Spirit's direction. We read it at the very beginning in Acts chapter uh, 13, the first few verses. But he set apart as they fasted and prayed, Paul and Barnabas, for the first missionary journey. And on that journey, it tells us Paul and Barnabas continued to fast and pray. They wanted the Holy Spirit's leading, right? 
asking for the Holy Spirit's lead, even as they appointed elders for the new churches. And the gospel was spread. So here's the deal. Earlier, I asked this question. If life's basically going okay, but you've got a lot going on, why would you build these two spiritual habits into your schedule? Can I just give you a revelation today? Here's, here's, here's why. Because your life's not about you. Man, you're quiet. My life's not about me. We gave up the right to make everything about us when we accepted what Jesus did on the cross. And when we accept what Jesus did on the cross, our lives become about what's going to honor him. See, we have a lot of mindsets in, in, in American culture. It's even increasing that way that everything is about what I want, what I need. And, and sometimes we call a lot of things that we need, they're actually wants, and we get our wants and needs mixed up, amen? I really need a new boat. Do we need a new boat? You may want a new boat, but I think the word need might not be the appropriate word. No matter how much you love fishing. Right? See, our lives are not about us. It's about what God wants for us. God wants us to spread his gospel all over the world. And as we pray in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, here's what it says. Your kingdom come... Your will be done here as it is in heaven. We struggle with that, don't we? Because the reality is, it's like, well, God, I, I really want this. And there are things in our life that we struggle. We can't even pray that prayer honestly sometimes because we're not ready to give some things up. So why should we pray and fast? It's because we want the gospel of Jesus to be spread. We want more people to come to know Jesus and be reconciled to God. We want Jesus' kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want his will to be done in our life so that he might be glorified. Amen? When we ask Jesus Christ into our heart to forgive us of our sins, we don't just invite him to become our savior. We invite him to become our Lord. And fasting helps us put him in his proper place as we deny things that, that, that make us comfortable. We're elevating him in our life. Jesus prayed a similar prayer when he was just before he was going to the cross. What did he say? God, Father, if there's a way that I don't have to die like this, I'm looking for the way. But nevertheless, not what I want, but Father, what you want. And if Jesus, the Son of the living God, who was fully man and fully God, had to pray a prayer of self-denial, don't you think we do too? We have to get our flesh and what we desire under control. So I want to talk real quick just about some basics of prayer. Two reasons why prayer is so incredibly important and in fasting. Number one, God loves our prayers. Do you believe that? I think sometimes we, we view it as a, as a checklist thing. God loves it when you pray to him. In fact, it tells us in scripture that he delights in it. He loves our prayers. Proverbs 15, 8 says this. The second half of that says, but the prayer of the upright pleases him. He loves it. He absolutely delights in our prayers. In Genesis 5, it describes how Enoch walked faithfully with God and he got so close to God that God said, you know what, Enoch? I think I'm just gonna bring you home. You're not even gonna have to, to pass away. I'm just gonna bring you with, to be with me. God loved that time that he spent with him. In Isaiah 41, eight, and here's what it says. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. God says, Abraham, you're my friend. 
Can I ask you a question? How many have ever had the thought that I'm God's friend? God wants to have that relationship with you. He wants to have that intimacy and that closeness with you, but it only happens when we pray and when we get in the presence of God and at times when he calls us that we fast. God loves our prayers. Secondly, Jesus prayed regularly. We read in scripture a few of his prayers. Matthew 26, 39, obviously this is just right before his, his crucifixion, but it tells us that he went kind of a little farther from the disciples and he fell to his face and, and, and he prayed and he said, Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as what I want, but Father, what you want. We read the same prayer in the book of Luke and I'm sorry, in the book of John chapter 12. A little different words that John records, but it's the same message. He says in John 12, 27, Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this reason that I came. I love that because his request is, Father, if I don't have to do this, I don't want to die like this. It's going to be painful. And even Jesus answers his own question. What does he say? No. I already know. This is why I came. There is no other way. It seems that his habit was to pray often and even early. In Mark 1.35, it tells us this. It says, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. In Luke chapter 5, verse 16, we read something similar. Luke records this. He says, and I like this one because it says, Jesus what? Often, not occasionally, not rarely, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Before choosing his 12 disciples, in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, he spent all night in prayer. It tells us as he offered up prayers and petitions in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, with fervent cries and tears. It also tells us in Hebrews 5, 7, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears. Right? If Jesus needed, let me ask you. Let me ask you this first. How many have a sinful nature in the room? If your hand's not up, you're just lying. I do. It is much easier for me to be selfish than it is to be generous. It's easier to make the wrong choice, we talked about it a moment ago, than it is to make the right choice, right? We have a sinful nature. Let me ask you this. Did Jesus have a sinful nature? He was fully man, and he was tempted, right? It tells us Satan tried to tempt him but he was also fully God. So the flesh side of him had the ability to make the wrong choice, but the divine side of him was strong because he communicated with his father and his flesh was strengthened. So let me ask you this. If Jesus had a human side and a divine side, and all we have is a human side, if Jesus needed to regularly break away and connect with his Father, how much more do we need it? I don't know about you, but I can't live the way God wants me to if I'm not connected to him. If I'm not praying and seeking his face... I can't do it. And what a gift it is to be able to approach God at any time in prayer. That's why Jesus died for us. 
not just to forgive us our sins, but to give us an advocate with God. The Bible says he now sits at the right hand of God and he's praying for you and for me sitting at the right hand of God. And that when he died on the cross, that the veil that separated the holy of holies, the presence of God from common people, that that veil was torn in half and now anyone can come into the presence of God. But the reality is this, guys. Jesus gave us this gift where we can step into a powerful, living relationship with him and we kind of step back and we're like, well... I asked you into my heart. I'm ready to go to heaven, but I don't want to get too crazy. If I commit too much, I might have to give up some things. Can I tell you something? That suspicion is absolutely right. The closer you get to God, the more he'll say, um, let's work on this. And it drives me nuts. It really does. Because the closer I get to God, God will say, hey, Steve, man, we, we need to work on, on this, this attitude. And my first inclination is, man, there's so many other people getting away with a whole lot worse. And you want to mess with this attitude, God. Do, it, do you guys ever respond that way? So I will confirm your suspicion the closer you get to God, the more he's going to mess with your comfort. But that's a good thing. Because the more he messes with your comfort, the more you let go of the things that are stealing your peace and stealing your joy and stealing the fullness that God wants you to have in life. So I want to give you some quick basics. These are just practicals as we talk about fasting and prayer. Real quick. Six reasons to, to fast that are found in Scripture, and I'm just really going to read these six to you so I don't have six points that I'm just starting now. <laughs> but number one, to fortify our prayers. How many know fasting strengthens our prayers? It makes them stronger. And not only that, but it also brings our prayers into line with God's will. Because we become less concerned about what we want and more concerned with what he wants. Number two, to repent from sin. Man, every time I fasted and prayed, there are things that God brings to my attention in my life that I was kind of blind to. And he says, I don't want you doing that anymore. I don't want you dealing with that anymore. And I have to come before God and say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me for that. Number three, to spiritually prepare for ministry. Can you say, well, whew, I'm, I, I get off the hook on that one. I'm not called to ministry. Oh, yes, you are. We are all called to ministry. Some of you may not be called to, 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 to lead or pastor a church, but you're called to ministry. Where you work and in your home and where you go for recreation and your friendships and relationships, God wants you to be a minister. He wants you to, to love on people and to lead them to a relationship with Jesus. You're not where you're at just because you're there. God has put you as a follower of Christ where you are for a reason. Just like Queen Esther, she said, hey, maybe I'm here to save the Jews for such a time as this. Maybe you're where you are for such a time as this. Number four, to receive power for ministry. It will give you strength and boldness and power to do the ministry he calls you to do. Number five, to discover the Lord's will. Some people are in a limbo like, man, do I, do I take this step? Do I go this step with my business? Do I go this way or this way with my family or kids or whatever the case might be? Fasting and prayer will give you clarity and direction on the way you need to go. Sixth and, and lastly, to seek protection from possible danger. How many know God blesses his people? He wants to bless us. He wants to protect us. And for many of us, fasting as a spiritual discipline is not very familiar. And I just want to give you real quick just a couple of real basic things here. Be aware of the Holy Spirit's promptings as you're doing it. Make a specific commitment to complete the fast and communicate to the people you need, that need to know. And that's probably just your family. And I want to tell you something. When you're fasting... Not everybody needs to know. 
I've seen people that are like, hey, you want to go out and eat? No, I'm super spiritual this week. I can't go eat with you. The Bible kind of talks about that, doesn't it? It says that when you fast, back in, in the religious leaders in Jesus' day, they would intentionally make themselves look weaker and grayer and, and, and not take care of themselves so that when they walk, people go, oh, they're fasting. They're super spiritual, right? And Jesus looks at me and says, no, no, you wash your hair. You clean yourself up. You don't need to tell everybody what you're doing because it's for me, not for everyone else. So yeah, you communicate to the people who need to know, but not everybody needs to know how extremely spiritual you are. If you miss the sarcasm, I'm, it's okay. <laughs> Have a specific purpose for the fast. Have a couple, a few things that you exactly are fasting and praying for and determine the length of it. Start with, if you've never fasted, don't start with a 40-day one, please. <laughs> right, I mean, 24 hours, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. Or a couple of meals or the Holy Spirit will lead you on what and how you need to fast. And, and I'm just gonna make a couple disclaimers here. If you've got medical issues, check with your doctor, please. How's that? That's all I'm gonna say. Sounds hard, doesn't it? So why should we do it? Again, if life's basically going okay and you got a lot going on, why are you gonna do it? Because here's the deal. It's not like prayer and fasting are some kind of formula for automatically getting what we want from God. So why do we do it? Why do we do it? Well, it spreads the gospel. We already talked about that. But here is the key. As we close, more than anything else, prayer and fasting is about getting us aligned with God's heart and his mission. I'm gonna use a phrase that I don't even know if it's a phrase, but I'm gonna make it one. It gets the... Here's the phrase, soul clutter out of our life when we fast and pray. I will stand here this morning and tell you as your pastor, I have clutter in my soul. And God is constantly trying to work that stuff out of us. And prayer and fasting creates a, 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 an environment where God can get that soul clutter out of the way so we can connect with God and he can direct us to his will. So the question is, do you want to get aligned with God's mission? Do you want to get aligned with what God wants to do in your heart and in your church? Do you want your heart to beat with his? And how much do you care about his will being done on earth as it is in heaven? If you want it as a formula for getting what you want, that's not the point. But if you want to care more about God's mission than what you want, this is a good way to start. The following prayer, and we referenced it already, is the first couple lines of the Lord's Prayer. If you want God to align your heart with his so that you care about his mission, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, says this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. How many recognize that prayer? Verse 10 says this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So can you pray that and mean it? If you can't pray that and really mean it, God, your will be done in my life here now to the detail and the degree that you want it done in heaven. If you can't pray that and mean it, then can I suggest we may have some soul clutter. You may have some things in your life that you're like, man, if I get this committed I may have to let go of some things. And then we start to go, I'm not ready to let go of those things. But I will tell you something. As you fast and pray, the presence of the Lord will begin to rise up in your, in your life, in your atmosphere, 
everywhere you go. And all of a sudden, the things that you're like, man, I'm not ready to give that up. All of a sudden, those things become, I'm not ready to give up this peace for that clutter. It shifts. But you've got to commit yourself to giving God the priority to where that shift in your life begins to take place where it goes from I'm not ready to give that up to I'm not ready to give up the presence of God. Because once you've walked and lived in the presence of God, everything else pales. It fades. It just becomes stuff that we don't need. It just becomes stuff that we use in order to live and advance what God wants to do. And I know this morning this was not a fluffy, feel-good message, but my prayer is, and we're going to spend some more time on prayer and fasting, and at the end of it we're going to, to, to begin to talk specifically about fasting as a body of, of believers. But God is calling us to go beyond spending an hour and a half at church on Sunday and saying, well, check, see you next week to a deep, rich relationship with Jesus that only comes through seeking his face. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Bow your heads with me if you would. Amen. God, we just come just humble. Humble that you love us so much. God, the the very God that created this world, this universe that spoke life into existence, wants to fellowship with us. The very God that created everything we see calls us my friend. And Lord, I pray today that we would be those that would step into a fuller relationship with you through a commitment to prayer and fasting. And Lord, we recognize that if your son Jesus, who died for our sins and who was fully God and yet fully man, if he needed to pray, Lord, how much more do we need your presence? Lord, speak to us, challenge us today, Lord. And I pray across this room that, God, if there's some here that do not know you in this way or have not asked you into their heart that, Lord, before we leave this place, God, they would come to know you, that they would pray the prayer and mean it and say, God, I am ready to step into what you have for me. We give you the praise and we thank you for it and what you're going to do as well. In Jesus' name, amen. With your heads bowed and eyes closed this morning for just a few minutes. This morning, I just want to ask you to say, Steve, I'm here, and I don't know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. At least you'd say, not in the way that you described this morning. So I've been around church, or, or maybe I've asked Christ into my heart, and I've kind of walked away from that commitment, or maybe you never have. I don't know. But you'd say, man, I know that Jesus is speaking to my heart, and that I need to ask him to become my Savior and my Lord, leader of my life, forgiver of my sins. If that's you this morning, I just want to ask if you would, right where you're at, this is a response not to me, but to the Lord. But you just slip up your hand and say, Steve, I need to ask Jesus into my heart and into my life. Anyone at all, would you just slip up your hand and put it right back down, just... Right now, just quick enough so we can see it as a commitment to the Lord. Anyone, before we pray. Anyone. I'm going to give you just a moment and then we're going to move on. Is there anyone? Last time I'm going to ask. You'd say, man, I need to give my life to Jesus. Would you slip it up? I just feel like you're somebody that God's speaking to your heart. We're going to move on, but I don't want to move on too soon. If God's speaking to you, would you just slip it up? Amen. 
Second thing I want to ask is this. You say, Steve, I've done that. I've asked Christ into my heart. I, 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 I know him. But man, I have not stepped into the fullness of what he has for me. Spending that time in prayer and the disciplines that you talked about of prayer and fasting. But you say, man, I know God's speaking to my heart and I know that he's calling me into more. I want to ask you the same thing. Would you just slip up your hand, put it right back down? Thank you. I see that one. Thank you. Thank you. Hands all over the place. Thank you. I mean, you know, when a group of people begin to fast and pray, there's no limit to what God can do. This morning, I'm not going to ask our prayer team to come forward like we usually do. Amy's going to lead us in a song. Because this is less about us praying and, and it's just a personal commitment that says, I'm going to step out and I'm going to step in and I'm going to go deeper. And as Amy leads us, can we just worship together for a few minutes? And if you slipped up your hand or if you didn't and God's still speaking to your heart, can we pray that prayer? A prayer of commitment. Ask God, say, God, I'm going to start doing this and that it's a commitment to him, but one he's also going to empower you to keep. Amen. Can we do that this morning? Let's join together. Let's worship as Amy leads us for a few minutes. Sometimes I fall. Sometimes I'm not. I'll bless your name.
It's not about what you don't get to do. It's never about the elimination. It's always about what he puts on the inside of you that pushes the craving for that out. When you fill your life with him, in his presence, in his word, with your worship, and you eliminate all of the distractions like the, the 80s music on your radio in your car, if you'll eliminate that and fill your space with his worship, with a focus on him, that craving that you have for that just goes away. It becomes unnecessary. So it's not about getting rid of what you have. It's about not being satisfied anything but him. That's why we sing, you're worthy of it all. Not because he's worthy, but because we realize the stuff means nothing. Only his presence. Above you all are, are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory, Father. Can we sing it? Worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Thank you. 
Amen. Church, he's worthy. Amen. And the cost pales in comparison to the blessings when we seek his face. Amen. I think my wife was reaffirming um, what the Lord had spoken to me a couple years ago with the 80s rock thing. Um, I remember I do a lot of driving, especially on my hospice chaplain days, and I used to just listen to that all the time. And I like classic rock. I don't know if anybody can relate. And I don't like the, I mean, I like the rock, you know. I know. And I was listening one day, and I'm like, man, this stuff is awful. I don't know why I didn't pick up on that when I was a teenager, but I'm like, man, this, this stuff is, this is an awful message. And the Lord started dealing with me about that. And, you know, there are things that you may enjoy, and we let go of those as God speaks to our heart. But the beautiful thing is, is what he puts in is way better than anything you let go of. The peace, the joy, the comfort, the, the relationships, the deeper walk, the deeper journey. I assure you, what you get will far exceed anything that you could possibly give up. Amen? Amen. We're going to close in prayer. I want to encourage you. Uh, be here Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. Um, Dave uh, Leto did our Wednesday nights through May and did a great job. And so this month, Warren Huntsberger, one of our, uh, our people attend here, he also is a retired pastor. He's doing Wednesday nights in June and uh, kind of he's hitting on divine healing, did an incredible job last Wednesday night. Um, so be here Wednesday night, six o'clock and uh, just uh, come expecting the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We will see you uh, soon. God bless you.